It's Friday, and it's now the 58th edition of the Zogby Report, Real and Unscripted. Jeremy and I have been doing this over a year now together and having a lot of fun, as a lot of you can tell, coming at things from a different point of view many times. Sometimes um, we actually agree, but whatever it is, it's always civil and respectful, and thank you for enjoying it as much as you do. Uh, hey, Jer, how are hey, you? Not too bad. How about you? Good. Thank you. We are in different states right now, just like the old days. Okay. Um, and so nice to nice to see your face here. Uh, so, you know, uh, in, in going over last week's podcast, towards the tail end, the last few minutes, we, we hinted at a topic, and, and that was, to what degree will we change as humans, as Americans, uh, after COVID? Just trying to speculate a little bit. We touched on it only just in the last few minutes, and we promised ourselves, as well as our listeners and viewers, that we'd get into it more this week. And so, uh, if it's all right with you, I'd like to kick it off a, a little bit, and give me a, a few minutes as, that's how uh, we usually do it. That's how we usually do it. Okay, and I usually ask. So, just just keeping uh, tradition. So, just giving some thought. Let's go back a century, and don't worry, folks. I'm not going to take it year by year, month by month. But when I look at the the major crises of the last hundred years, I see a completely different results. So, for example. After World War I, so many people were uh, disillusioned with the enormity of the war, the length of the war, the sacrifice that had to be made, that we did in fact go on a binge and we went off in two different directions. Uh, and one direction was the Roaring Twenties. And literally it was a binge. Uh, it was a rejection of prohibition it was a rejection of the traditional bonds and definitions of what it means to be a young woman. Uh, and uh, a good time was, quote, supposed to be had by all. By the same token, it was a lost generation as well. And we had uh, young artists and intellectuals who expatriated, moved to Paris or uh, other places, uh, completely disillusioned by the high promises of the sacrifice of the war, and then left with death and disillusion. We head then to a period of, of depression and war, uh, lots of years of suffering and sacrifice during World War II, and then afterward, a binge of a different sort. Uh, we settled into families and moved into suburbs and went to college, in fact. But by the same token, uh, after years of deprivation during the Depression and then sacrifice uh, during uh, World War II, we bought refrigerators and we bought cars and we bought, in a few years after the war, television sets and consumer goods and consumer culture. And we had babies, the post-war baby boom. Um, and so then we jump into the 70s and it's an energy crisis. And for the first time uh, for many, Americans are being asked after a per lengthy period of prosperity to slow it down, you know, to buy smaller cars, turn down the thermostat, stop wasting energy. And this is one that seems to have mattered because even though we eventually, under Ronald Reagan, would start buying the large cars again, the, the minivans as they were known back then, and the trucks, the fact of the matter is that we, we became aware of the environment, and many Americans continued to conserve. And our kids were taught not to litter in school, and we began in the 80s to recycle, and there was a consciousness of the environment. So that's one change that lasted, and then we jump to 
And we did, as I've alluded before, we at Zogby did some tracking polls uh, within a couple of weeks after 9-11 to see how Americans would change. We saw changes and fears, uh, uh, new attitudes, not paranoia per se, but fear in the in the first few weeks and the first couple of months after 9-11. And then our tracking polls showed what was actually happening on the ground. And that is that aside from the changes in transportation, you know, in the airport security and the consciousness of global terrorism, Americans went back to their day-to-day -day lives pretty much uh, and just opted to live. And so here we are now with the worst pandemic in a in hundred years um, and perhaps an end in sight, but perhaps not an end in sight. And we talked a little bit and I projected last week that there'd be some significant behavioral changes that many of us would not go back to the handshaking, the hugging, the kissing, the large crowds, the binging. Uh, we would maintain some levels of social distancing and so on. But this week, I only want to hint at the fact that there were tremendous technological changes that were changing our lives already. And that what the pandemic has done is accelerated those changes. Many of us will not be going back to the workplace. Uh, many of us will um, uh, have robots as coworkers. Many of us will be facing uh, trying to find different ways of earning a living and not working in offices uh, or working on assembly lines or whatever the case may be. There's, uh, significant changes, sacrifices in privacy, uh, telemedicine, uh, that life will not be the same. Directly caused by the pandemic, yep, in some instances, uh, but accelerated uh, or accelerating what already has been changing our, in our lives. Uh, yes, absolutely, it'll be a different America and a different humanity on the other side. All right, that's a lot, but I promised a big start. What do you think? Well, <clears throat> I'm tempted to go through piece by piece, um, but I think I'll, I'll save our listeners a, a, a response to every point that would, that would probably take up the rest of the show. I'll, I'll pick up with, with what's that? That's all right with me. I mean, feel free. Well, you know, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll weave in and out, but it, it's, yeah, I, I mean, evolution, right? Change is always happening. Technology is is increasingly changing at a faster rate. And, you you know, you've said, and uh, I agree to this, that I think I agree, the, the, the genie's out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. but, but, but I don't think that's the central question. I don't think the question is, do we put the genie back in the bottle? Um, or, do, or do we let it out? I, I, that, I think, is impossible. So I think the, the, the more central question is who has a say in, in how things go forward? Does it come from the technocratic elite? Or do the people have, have a, a stake in this? And so we pick up with, with this most recent crisis, COVID-19, and almost immediately, uh, there were projections coming out. Not to say that this stuff wasn't really talked about, but it became public knowledge after COVID-19. I'm talking about the Great Reset, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. You know, the people who follow Davos and, and the World Economic Forum and, and maybe, you know, publications like The Economist have heard of uh, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. But I think the, the lay person for the first time was introduced to this topic of the Great Reset, 
The Great Reset is basically taking our world and then just hitting the reset button. And then I, I've said, you know, kind of like it seems to be a controlled demolition and then building back better as the phrase that was used with Boris Johnson, Joe Biden, and the head of the IMF and the head of the World Bank and uh, Justin Trudeau and the world over, the powerful leaders were saying the same thing, build back better. And that was actually the moniker that comes from the World Economic Forum. And so, you know, it jumped out at me, I think or somewhere around the summer, June or July, the one, you know, there were these series of videos that were coming out on YouTube and, and other channels about the Great Reset. And one of them was 10 predictions. And what really jumped out at me, well, I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of them was, you will have no possessions and you will be happy. Well, I don't know. You know, that that language is 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 could be troublesome to, to some people to 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 say maybe it could have been stated as perhaps we will have no possessions, or um, it could be a, a wonderful thing if we had no possessions, but no, the language was you will have no possessions and you will be happy. And you know, among other things, there was there will be no consumption of meat. Meat will be replaced by, you know, lab-grown meat uh, or you know, whatever kind of, you know, 3D printed meat. And so you listen to the language and for some people, it, it's almost like paternalistic. It's mm -hmm. almost like um, arrogant. Um, and, and I think that could be a tendency of, of some of these global institutions that, that, you know, have these agendas and talk about them, but talk about them almost in a forceful way, like, this is the way forward. This is what's going to happen. But uh, it, does it really happen like that? And, and keep in mind all the while, someone like Klaus uh, Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, talks about stakeholder capitalism. Well, I, I'm sure he's elaborately laid out what stakeholder capitalism is. But to me, it's just kind of interesting that a name like that, stakeholder capitalism, to me, I would interpret it as, oh, I have a stake in this. Because right, I'm a stakeholder, right? You're a stakeholder. We're all stakeholders. And so if I'm a stakeholder and we're all stakeholders, maybe we should have a say in this. Maybe we should get some feedback. Maybe the World Economic Forum should become a world public forum. Maybe there should be a vote, but you don't really see it talked about like that. You, you kind of see it talked about as this is the agenda, this is what's going to happen, and this is how it's going to work. And that all ties back to a lot of what you were talking about with you know World War I and the energy crisis in the 70s. You know, if we go back to the Roaring Twenties, few of us realize uh, that that Roaring Twenties, a major backdrop of it was a credit expansion mm -hmm. that, that was cre uh, created by the Federal Reserve, the, the, uh, the central bank, in, in artificially stimulating low interest rates, which creates readily available credit, which is allowed for this, this boom, this artificial boom, which allowed for the bust. Um, that's important because... We tend to look at the, the Roaring Twenties as entirely a, a bottom-up social, you know, mo, you know, socially motivated. But no, actually, a lot of it was top-down. The same thing with the 70s energy crisis. Where did that come from? That is directly tied to Richard Nixon's policy of ending the Bretton Woods uh, and taking the nation off of the gold standard. And within, you know, the same time period, you see inflation running rampant and, and stagflation. There's no question about it. That's what the result is. So we, we look at these changes and, and we think oftentimes that they're they're organically grown. And while, while there's some truth to that, a lot of it is they're driven from the top down. And to wrap up my final point is, if, we, if we're really gonna talk seriously about stakeholder capitalism, and we're gonna talk about the future of humanity, then the, then the humanity has to have a say in it. I learned a lot, um, and maybe I'll just modify. 
and suggests that there would have been no discussion uh, at and by the folks at the and types of the World Economic Forum if there had not been pressure from below. But in fact, there were a lot of people in the streets and a lot of social media and a lot of unrest and a lot of voting and from my vantage point, very strange uh, voting um, in places, particularly uh, throughout the West, that brought to the attention to the this elite that hey, um, things do have to change, or the public is not not going to buy it. And so we have the actually not so much a mandate from the top as kind of as some of our friends would say, a creative collision uh, between the top and the bottom. Um, and that this is the elite trying to hold on to something that it sees getting out of its, uh, out of its control. And so stay tuned politically. Uh, there's, uh, as Sam Cooke was said, a lot of change is gonna come, right? Change is going to come. And that was, uh, that was um, I believe, an intelligence here, issue number eight. Yes. Set, you know, I think it was eight. Um, yeah, I mean, you could very well be correct in, in, in your assessment. But, but the thing that we, we have to address is that the obvious, um, how do I want to say, zeitgeist, if you will, really, I think today, and, 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 and COVID, I think COVID poured the fuel on the fire, but it was already there. Because remember when we started this podcast, we were talking about uh, riots in the streets globally, 2020, the year of the riot. And mm -hmm. that all shut down with COVID. But, you know, scientific law says energy doesn't disappear, it only dissipates. So it was brewing while people were locked down. And it's not like that anger was just going to disappear. It probably only, you know, perhaps doubled, maybe not doubled, but grew. And so then it, 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 it poured out and it wasn't just the United States. It's in Europe. It's still in, I think, I, st I think it's still in Hong Kong and, and other places. The point that I'm trying to make is the zeitgeist is clearly the elite versus the anti-elite. And the more that the elite paint the anti-elite as crazy wackadoos, the more they can ensure that, that this will be a very nasty and bad situation. And so I would encourage any member of, of, of the elite, you know, whether that's the World Economic Forum, the IMF, the World Bank, the Bank of International Set Settlements, the, the folks at the Hague, the folks at the highest levels of the European Union, folks in DC, London, you get it. Um, the Davos crowd, I, I, would, I would invite them to listen. Listen and understand the people who have massive amounts of distrust towards you. Don't dismiss them as crazy wackadoos. People are suffering. Mm -hmm. I would be so bold to say as to the elite, you are not suffering. Life is pretty good for you. Life is, heck, life is great for you. But for a lot of people, people are hanging on by their threads. So be careful of the language that you use. Be careful of, of the agendas that you speak about and, and how uh, that they will be rolled out. Invite people to have a forum because at the end of the day, we all value democracy. At the end of the day, we all value liberal democracy. And there's nothing liberal or democratic about shunning people, millions and millions and millions of people to the side and labeling them and, and looking at them in the worst possible way. All that's going to do is just justify their views that are already pretty negative. So let me bring this back full circle and just simply suggest that I think we're fundamentally in agreement. And that agreement is that the world is changing. It's, and as you put, it's changing rapidly and it's been accelerating. And so now the tension is over 
who gets to control the change. Um, on one hand, uh, the strong movement for democracy, but democracy, uh, as we could see, even going back as far as the founding fathers, is something that elites are very wary about. Um, in fact, you could write a book from mobocracy, that's what John Jay and Thomas Jefferson talked about, to a basket full of deplorables, which is what Hillary talked about. Um, and that all of these forces remain. This is the political battle of this era, of populism versus anti-populism or elite versus democratic forces. But by the same token, and fasten your seatbelts, democracy is not always pretty. And democracy does tend to, um, to elect uh, people that a lot of other folks don't like. And the troubling thing is that whether it's the elite or the folks in the virtual streets, um, we're at a point now where whoever loses more and more is unwilling to accept the results of a quote free and fair election and so we've we've got uh, a you know a period of instability ahead of us and perhaps some, one of the things we may talk about next week that we uh haven't really even alluded to but in this context is that it's 10 years now for the arab spring and we're starting to learn uh, more and more about how that movement is not dead. It's just sort of uh, dormant and on hold, but it is not dead at all. Another hot spot to be watching. What do you think? Yeah. Well, you know, I the Middle East is, is something I haven't followed in a while. Um, but I mean, just look at Lebanon. Um, I would imagine Egypt is, is still has a lot of tension. Of course, it's not just economics, it's not just politics, but it's also, right, it's also moving into the digital economy. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I always made this comparison that if you looked at the first 1400 years of, of Christianity, right, the 1400 years was, was an important mark because yeah, you had diversity within, I mean, a few centuries back, you had the, the break with the Orthodox Church. And then even in the early, the first couple centuries, you had some some theological battles over the nature of the, the, the Trinity. But really, the, the major point uh, in the history of Christendom is is Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. And it's not entirely Martin Luther. It's it's more so the the invention of the printing press. Mm -hmm. which allowed for a dissemination of different interpretations and different ideas and Christendom then split and splintered. And I, and I've always, and I could, I might offend somebody. I could possibly offend somebody of the, the Islamic faith, but I would just draw a comparison and say that, okay, you do have the split between Sunni and Shia. That's the most obvious split, but remember, uh, Islam started in the 7th century, that is the 600s. Here we are in the 21st century. We're looking at 14, 1500 years. And what has happened in the last 20, 30 years is the basically the digital equivalent of the printing press. So mm -hmm. I think that that's the overarching trend of Islam is perhaps the, the perhaps, I'm not going to make a, a prediction, what we saw in, in Christendom many different interpretations, many different splinterings. It's a possibility. I, I will say one more thing uh, regarding democracy and mobocracy. You, you're absolutely right. And thank you for reminding me of that. I mean, obviously the founding fathers started off this nation with, with people you know, who own land, only they could vote because of their distrust towards the masses. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave with this one quote. Ben Franklin said that, when the voters discover that they can vote themselves money, that will herald the end of the republic. <laughs> okay, uh, let's leave it at that. Um, enjoy your trip, and um, we'll you and I will talk before. But uh, everybody, uh, please spread this around. 
share it. If you like it, tell us you like it. Um, and keep writing your, your thoughts and ideas to us and to everybody else. Thanks. Have a good week. Next week. Too. Thank you. And, and I'll just say, please, please share it because there really is no other program like this. There are people much smarter than myself. I won't say smarter than my father, but much smarter than myself. But nobody's doing this, father and son. Nobody's doing this. Have a good week. Take care. Bye-bye.